right. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this online dilemma lecture, the first edition of it, uh, with Professor Rebecca Krodov with us today. Um, this is the first edition of a new lecture, lecture series organized by the Dilemma Project. Dilemma stands for Designing International Law and Ethics into Military AI. It's an inter interdisciplinary research project on military AI, uh, where with, with a focus on legal, ethical, and technical approaches to military AI. We look, we look in particular at how technology affects human agency and how to respond to this challenge from a multidisciplinary perspective. The project is funded by NWO, the Dutch Research Council, and it started last uh, September and will run for four years. Um, please have a look at the website of the ASER Institute for more information on the project and our activities, upcoming activities. Um, so as mentioned, this is the first edition of the Dilemma Lecture Series, and we are very glad and honored to have as a speaker, Dr. Rebecca Krotov, an expert on these issues. Rebecca Krotov is Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Richmond School of Law. And her research areas include technology law, international law, and torts law. In her research, she looks at how both domestic and international legal regimes respond to and shape technological developments, particularly in armed conflicts. On this topic, she has widely published influential pieces. Um, additionally, she has a number of affiliations, including with the uh, Yale Law School and the Center for New American Security. I invite you to check her full biography online uh, for more details. The topic of today's lecture is artificial intelligence, autonomous weapon systems, and accidents in war. Dr. Krotov will discuss accountability gaps in relation to new technology and offer some perspectives on how to remedy these gaps. Um, Rebecca will speak for about 35, 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A. To ask questions during the lecture, please use the chat functions in Zoom. Uh, you will find the button, at, the button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please type in your questions. We will collect them and answer them during the Q&A after the presentation. Again, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, we're glad to see you virtually in the room. And with that said, I would like to give the floor to Rebecca for the inaugural Dilemma Lecture. You're muted, Rebecca. You're still on mute. First mistake of the day, already handled. All right, great. <laughs> All right, well, thank you to Dr. Boutin and the Asser Institute for the honor of opening this lecture series um, as somebody very interested about the development of new technologies and the use of AI and autonomy in the armed conflict context. I am so excited about this lecture series um, and I am, am very much looking forward to attending subsequent events as a listener. Uh, all right, so today I'm going to be discussing how a host of new military technologies, including artificial intelligence and AI decision assistance, autonomous weapon systems, cyber operations, swarming drones, and others, are all drawing attention to and making more salient an accountability gap at the heart of international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law is the phrase I'm going to usually use it's also often referred to as the law of armed conflict or simply the law of war. Namely, under whatever you call it, <laughs> under this legal regime, there is no accountability for most undesired civilian harms in armed conflict. Instead, these undesired civilian harms, which might range from bombing the wrong building to anticipated collateral damage, lie that where they fall are borne by the innocent civilians themselves. Under international law, individuals who intentionally target civilians can be held criminally liable, um, and states that engage in internationally wrongful acts can be held responsible, but most acts that cause civilian harms are lawful and unintentional. And if this happens, no entity is legally accountable for the harmful consequences of that act. 
And while this has really <laughs> has long been recognized as a moral and a strategic issue, this legal accountability gap is becoming more legally salient as new military technologies simultaneously increase the risk to civilians and complicate the causal analysis, figuring out who to hold responsible when many actors are contributing uh, to, the, to the act. I do think there's a silver lining here. I feel like I've gotten very practiced at finding silver linings in a time of coronavirus. Um, but the silver lining here is that by throwing this problem into sharper relief, by making it more visible, tech-enabled conduct highlights this accountability gap and the need for accountability mechanisms for these undesired harms. It's becoming easier and easier to imagine uh, these harms <laughs> or the risks driving incentives for developing what I would call a war torts regime to hold states strictly liable for the costs of their accidents in armed conflict. And expanding state liability and establishing a route to a remedy would increase the likelihood that innocent victims could receive compensation for their injuries. It ideally would also incentivize, incentivize states to participate in fewer or at least safer engagements. Okay, so obviously there has always been undesired civilian harm in war. War is an inherently lethal and dangerous activity with far reaching side effects. And the fog of war, the uncertainty and situational awareness results in mistakes and sometimes with disastrous consequences for civilians. So take the 2015 US strike on the Kunduz Afghan Trauma Center, which was being operated by Medicine Sans Frontiers where 42 people were killed and over 30 others were injured. The US immediately characterized this attack as a mistake. And six months later, the US Department of Defense released its findings, which highlighted a series of human errors, so quote, human errors compounded by process and equipment failures. To list just a few of the errors that happened, uh, the aircraft had not uploaded a no strike list, its satellite radio data link failed, the targeting system stopped operating correctly after the aircraft took evasive maneuvers, which forced the crew to rely on visual identification of the target. When the crew had tried to determine that they had identified the right target, they described it to outside observers, but they described it using characteristics, architectural characteristics that were common for many buildings in the area. And the commander who ultimately approved the attack did so in violation of uh, the relevant US rules of engagement at the time. Despite all of these errors, right? And despite all of the different sources of errors here, neither the United States as the state nor any individual crewman could be held liable under international law. No one acted with the requisite intent for a war crime. They never intentionally targeted civilians or acted with a, with a sufficient level of recklessness. And the act itself wasn't an internationally wrongful act implicating the law of state responsibility. It was an accident and it was war and accidents happen. And this liability regime, or more accurately, this lack of a liability regime, I think is at odds with international humanitarian laws foundational aim. International humanitarian law exists in large part to minimize civilian suffering associated with war. There are a host of different principles and prohibitions and requirements that are designed to minimize the likelihood of causing harm to civilians, and states take these rules very seriously. I'm going to review three of the main requirements for lawful attacks in armed conflict. First, in every attack, the commander is required to distinguish between lawful and unlawful targets. Lawful targets are enemy combatants or military objects. Unlawful, and target, unlawful targets include civilians, civilian objects, and surrendering or wounded soldiers. As I already said, intentionally targeting civilians or any of these other unlawful targets is one of the most serious violations of international humanitarian law. And so commanders need to distinguish between lawful and unlawful targets to ensure they're not committing a war crime. Second, after distinguishing between lawful and unlawful targets and, so, and when planning an attack on a lawful target that's in the vicinity of unlawful targets, let's say a military base in an urban area, 
the commander also has to engage in the proportionality analysis. This requires determining whether the anticipated military benefits of attacking a target on one side outweighs the anticipated civilian harm associated with the attack on the other side. If the military benefit outweighs the anticipated civilian harm, the commander can go forward with the attack, even if they anticipate that unlawful targets will be harmed as a result, incidental to the attack. This anticipated but still undesired incidental civilian harm is commonly referred to euphemistically as collateral damage. Of course, <laughs> obviously, this calculation requires weighing apples and oranges, but it was relatively easy to calculate when attacks happened on a battlefield or the high seas, places where there weren't going to be a lot of civilians at risk. As armed conflicts have moved into urban areas, however, this analysis has become far more complicated. Third, in, distinct, in addition to the distinction and proportionality requirements, a commander also has to employ what's called feasible precautions to minimize the risk of civilian harm. Depending on the situation, this might entail blaring a warning, silently monitoring the target for changes that would affect the proportionality analysis, or employing less destructive weaponry. So these and other rules, while critically important, still permit a lot of undesired civilian harm, due both to accidents and collateral damage. As I tell my students over and over again, <clears throat> the law of war is a floor. It is not an aspirational standard. It is not what we're trying to achieve. It is a baseline floor that still permits lots of harmful conduct. And one point I'm going to argue today is that many new military technologies introduce additional risks that increase the likelihood of both accidental harm and collateral damage. Before I elaborate on this, I should note two qualifications. First, there are obviously a number of valid reasons why states are researching developing and deploying new weapons technologies. These technologies are going to be better at certain tasks, and there are going to be situations where states have a legitimate interest in fielding them. In some situations, they may arguably even reduce civilian harms, and to the extent they do, fantastic, <laughs> right? The point I want to emphasize is that we can't ignore the fact that these new technologies also create more risks and sources of harm for civilians, and it's unfair that civilians have to bear that burden. My second qualification. Many of my examples are about American accidents, but I am certain that this is far more a consequence of my media consumption um, and what I'm exposed to as an American than that these risks are unique to American warfighting. Instead, these examples highlight different risks associated with increasingly common military technologies that are, by, that are being used by states across the globe. Okay, so let's start with accidental harm. There are four main sources of accidental harm. Weapons errors, user errors, data errors, and communication errors. Starting with weapons errors, this is a very familiar concept. Everybody understands the idea of a weapons malfunction and why that would be particularly problematic in an armed conflict scenario. But it's worth noting as we incorporate software into weaponry, into everything from landmines to fighter jets to swarming drones to autonomous weapon systems to AI decision assistance, we are also incorporating new sources of error. Any system that is built around code is subject to bugs, and bugs, bugs being programming errors that cause unanticipated results. Bugs are so common that many argue in domestic law that we can't hold programmers liable for the harmful consequences of bugs in software because they're just actually impossible to eliminate ahead of time entirely. And of course, bugs have lethal effects in armed conflict. In 2007, a software glitch resulted in a South African anti-aircraft cannon malfunction that ended up killing nine soldiers and wounding 14 others during a training exercise. And the more complicated the code, the more opportunity there is for accidents. 
According to normal accident theory, over a long enough time horizon, accidents are inevitable in complex and, and tightly coupled systems. They occur even in the most highly regulated and safety conscious in industries as exemplified by the Challenger accident, the Three Mile Island meltdown, and the 2010 stock market flash crash. We don't know what the accidents are going to look like. We don't know how they're going to manifest ahead of time. But even if I stop my presentation here, we know that accidents due to glitches in software are going to happen. Then there's also user error. Again, it's a pretty familiar problem that can arise due to poor or inadequate training or just the stress of working in high pressure situations. But again, here we have new technologies creating new kinds of user errors. Those who are arguing for automating systems, automating more systems, often emphasize how useful it will be to human combatants and human commanders to be able to offload certain tasks to a machine right, to delegate certain decisions or getting advice to a machine. But as Liz and Bainbridge observed 40 years ago, one of the great ironies of automation is that the more automated a system is, the more important the human being in that system becomes and the more difficult their job becomes. This is because as easier tasks, you know, quote unquote, easier tasks are delegated to machine intelligence, the human's job becomes harder. Not only is the human now expected to do the harder parts of their job more often, right, without the breaks of the easier tasks, they're often expected to do these harder tasks while simultaneously overseeing and monitoring a system that is subject to all the new sources of errors that I've mentioned before and will continue to go on about. This requires a completely different and additional skill set. Furthermore, human beings also have a documented tendency to defer to the decisions of automated systems or artificially intelligent systems. This trait is commonly referred to as automation bias. In a flight simulator study, for example, test participants reported that they trusted a computer that they had been told was not 100% accurate. They trusted its conclusions more over other instruments that they had been told were 100% accurate. And there are plenty of examples of overtrust leading to accidents. There are at least four instances of people who followed their navigation directions from a GPS and drove into ponds, into lakes, into bays, and even into the ocean. In an armed conflict context, again, this overtrust can have deadly consequences. In 2003, on three separate occasions, the U.S. Defense of Patriot System misclassified friendly planes as ballistic missiles, and based on this misclassification, the operator of those systems ordered them to engage the perceived threat, despite having information available that contradicted the system's assessment. So these operators trusted the system too much, and people died as a result. And this overtrust was predictable. We knew about automation bias, but it's very, very hard to root out. The most famous example of useful undertrust occurred in 1983 when Petrov, who was then a lieutenant colonel of the Soviet Air Defense Forces, decided that the Soviet early warning system's report of launched US missiles was probably a false alarm, probably a malfunction. He was correct but he still had to decide in the moment to disobey direct orders and not respond. In doing so, he averted what might otherwise have become a large scale nuclear war. But just training users to under trust the systems they use isn't, the, isn't going to be a fail safe solution. If users under trust the system too much, then we risk overinvestment in useless or even harmful infrastructure. The captain of the USS John McCain quickly learned not to trust a new but glitchy navigation system, and so he often used it in a backup manual mode. Unfortunately, this undertrust created new risks because the manual mode, unbeknownst to him, disabled built in safeguards. And this use, because of his undertrust, contributed to a collision that killed 10 sailors and injured 48 others, which was the US Navy's worst accident at sea in the past 40 years. Okay, so we've got weapons errors, we've got user errors, there are also data errors. And 
data errors could manifest as making decisions based on incomplete or inaccurate data. For example, in 2001, because one single digit of a target's coordinates was entered incorrectly, a 2000 pound guided bomb missed its target by more than a mile. Instead of hitting a military helicopter at an airport, the bomb instead landed in a residential neighborhood, killing at least four and injuring eight more civilians. Many times, accidental civilian harm occurs when civilians are mis misidentified, misclassified as combatants, right? Instead of being considered unlawful targets, they're classified as lawful targets, usually due to poor human intel. But the more that militaries rely on big data and AI decision assistance to determine who might be hostile or even possibly a lawful target, the more likely we are to see mistakes due to errors baked into the data sets and algorithms. Machine intelligence is only going to be as smart and as useful as its training data, and it needs a lot of training data to be smart or useful. But militaries often won't have accurate data sets for new situations, right? For particular environments, particular towns, particular engagements that are sensitive to the, the time and place and culture of the place where these systems are going to be employed. And so there's a temp temptation to build AI, train AI on data sets from existing data from other areas or on simulated data, which is necessarily incomplete. Reusing data sets from old contexts or working with simulated and therefore incomplete data sets is going to risk fatal misidentifications in new contexts. Finally, the fourth category of accidental harm are communication errors. Again, this is another familiar concept. Information is lost in translation in the fog of war all the time. But any system that requires communicating information between human intelligence on one side and machine intelligence on the other also risks something being lost in translation or misinterpreted. And this is why the design interface is a third is its own source of error. <laughs> in addition to the human on one side and the machine on the other, the interface itself can be a source of error. Um, as Madeline, Madeline Ellish detailed in her Moral Crumple Zones paper, the 2009 Air France Flight 447 disaster, where all 228 people on board died, was particularly tragic as it was avoidable. It was due to compound, an error that was compounded by the design interface. It should have been relatively easy for the pilot to recover when the plane went into an aerodynamic stall. It was not a surprising type of problem. It was not an unfamiliar maneuver. But every time the pilot took steps to do so, the autonomous alert system wailed at the pilot panicking them further until the tragically the the plane crashed okay so those were the four categories of traditional sources of error that have been exacerbated or added to by new technologies but it's worth noting that new technologies also bring their own <laughs> brand new sources of error as well. Um, I'm always reminded of the Philip Larkin, This Be the Verse poem. Um, first, human beings are becoming more reliant on these systems and losing basic skills as a result. This is sometimes referred to just as skill fade. Studies have already shown that pilots' abilities to interpret unusual data or to independently keep track of their location has worsened after the introduction of autopilots. I know I am certainly much, much worse at navigating since I've gotten a GPS nav system, uh, though I do have yet to drive into a body of water. Second, while, we're be while we human beings are becoming more reliant on these systems, they're simultaneously becoming less secure. Any system that incorporates software also introduces new types of vulnerabilities that can be hacked or gamed or otherwise exploited by adversaries. In 2011, for example, Iran managed to spoof and thereby take control of a US Sentinel stealth drone. Uh, third, the increased speed of decision-making is often a selling point for automating military systems. The idea is that the entity with the faster OODA loop is more likely to win an engagement. But upping the speed also means 
not just upping errors, <laughs> but eliminating opportunities for noticing and correcting them. As Shannon French regularly notes, in most armed conflict situations, better decisions are often preferable to faster decisions. Faster OODA loops might help you win a dogfight, but they're going to be less relevant in deciding which target to attack or whether to attack a target at all. Okay. So far, I've been discussing accidental sources of civilian harm, but there's another major source of undesired civilian harm in armed conflict, which I've alluded to, collateral damage. Again, it's a euphemistic term for the civilians that are killed or wounded, the civilian objects, which are to say the buildings and the cultural objects that are destroyed, incidental to a lawful attack. Now, increasingly precise weapons are celebrated for their ability to minimize civilian harm. After all, right, the more precise the strike, the less likely it is to cause I'm sorry, to cause either anticipated or unanticipated civilian damage. Uh, but there's a precision paradox here. The ability to engage in more precise strikes also means that a military can engage in more strikes overall, because attacks that once would have failed the proportionality analysis and not been lawful now won't, right? And now will be lawful. Um, as Joram Dinstein put it, when a sledgehammer is excluded, the availability of a scalpel may open the legal door for attacks. And the more strikes, the more, opportun the more opportunities there are for anticipated and unanticipated civilian collateral damage or for something else to go wrong, any of the other types of accidents to happen. Okay, so to recap, there were already diverse sources of undesired civilian harm in armed conflict. New technologies are both exacerbating these and creating new ones. Simultaneously, and I fortunately don't have enough time to go into all the reasons why, but simultaneously, new technologies are complicating the causal chain, making it more difficult to establish that any one person was responsible for a given act. Many reports on accidents in war that we see refer to cascading errors. And in addition to making it difficult what to change to prevent a certain problem from occurring in the future, these complicated causal chains of cascading errors also make it either impossible or unfair to hold any one individual responsible for the ultimate harm. As a result, what, we've, what we're seeing develop is a more salient accountability gap for undesired civilian harm in armed conflict. Now, when there are discussions about accountability for new weapons technology, the focus tends to be on individual liability. I've heard if there's a malfunction due to poor programming, the whole the programmer should be accountable. If there's an error due to an interface issue, then the designer should be accountable. If the error is due to misuse, um, either due to poor training or just mistake, um, maybe we should hold the user or their commander or the weapons procurer accountable. But usually, when undesired civilian harm in armed conflict occurs, there's no one single person, not the programmer, not the designer, not the user, not anybody else in the causal chain who's going to act with the requisite intent to justify holding them liable, individually criminally liable. And this is what many refer to, especially in the context of discussions around autonomous weapon systems, as the accountability gap. I think that the lack of individual criminal liability is far too narrow of a concern and far too limited of a frame. Instead, I think there's a deeper accountability gap at the very heart of international humanitarian law. This is a legal regime that was founded in part with the aim of minimizing civilian suffering in armed conflict, but it has no doctrinal accountability mechanism for this undesired but still lawful harm. Every domestic legal regime does. If you get into a car accident, you can't claim that you're not liable for the harm because driving is an inherently dangerous activity, right? So. Maybe, maybe this lack of an accountability mechanism made sense when the Hague and the Geneva Conventions were being drafted, because at that point in time, there was no international criminal law. But over the past 70 years, international criminal law has developed to create 
individual criminal accountability for specific categories of harmful acts, war crimes. This focus, I think, has somewhat eclipsed the need for also, to also, in addition, have an accountability regime for harmful but lawful acts, what I call war torts. So domestic tort law, every state, creates consequences for lawful and valuable activities like driving automobiles or demolishing buildings or transporting dangerous chemicals when those activities cause others harm. Similarly, I think war torts could create consequences for the dangerous but still lawful and valuable activities associated with armed conflict. And just as criminal and tort law regimes coexist in domestic law, war crimes and war torts could coexist and complement each other in international law. As I explore in a forthcoming article, a war torts regime could be structured in various ways, but at present I think the ideal version would have three main characteristics. First of all, it would hold states, not individuals, strictly liable for the harmful consequences of their acts in armed conflict, with some exceptions to the strict liability part, and three, provide a route to remedy for victims. So I'll go through each of these. Let's start with holding states liable. The rise of international criminal liability and the focus on individual actors, I think has had the unfortunate side effect of overshadowing the import of also holding states liable for caused harm. Oftentimes the question that I see in discussions of new weapons technologies is who should be liable for undesired civilian harms. Instead, I think we've got to ask the broader question of which entity should be accountable. And when you ask the question like that and compare states to other potential defendants, the state is clearly the entity best situated to anticipate, mitigate, prevent, pay, and spread the costs of undesired civilian harms. The state commissions and procures military technology, and so it can make contracts conditional on meeting defined safety standards or otherwise incentivize the development of safe safer weapons. The state creates its rules of engagement, trains its military forces in them, and determines and enforces consequences for compliance failures. So it's best situated to create policies for the safe use of new technologies and train its forces in how to more safely employ them. The state also creates procedures for monitoring and updating their data banks and has operation level and individual targeting level information regarding where, when, and how targets are engaged. So the state is best able to ensure that that data is as accurate as possible. But as I've tried to emphasize, no matter how many precautions are taken, no matter what is done ahead of time, no matter how much care a state takes, there will still be accidents. And when accidents occur, I don't think those costs should fall on the innocent victims. The state is best able to compensate those victims and also best situated to construct domestic legal regimes that spread the cost of those accidents. Further, between the state on one side, which presumably benefits from the military action and the innocent civilian who is harmed as a result of that action, it's simply fair to ask the state to shoulder the unwanted costs, costs of its war making. Right. Second, I argue that states should be held strictly liable for caused harms. There are two main types of liability regimes. Strict liability regimes hold an entity that causes harm liable regardless of what steps that entity took to minimize the risk, right? Regardless of how much care was taken, the entity will still be held liable. Meanwhile, reasonable care or uh, negligence regimes will only hold an actor liable when the actor causes harm and didn't act with reasonable care. So obviously negligence regimes are far more defendant friendly, even if an act causes great harm, as long as the actor can show that they took reasonable care in preventing that harm, the costs fall on the victim. Um, under a strict liability standard, the actor usually bears the cost of undesired harm, whereas under a negligence standard or a reasonable care standard, those costs are borne by the victim. Obviously, in the context of developing a regime that's intended to better shield civilians or compensate victims for the horrors of war, I think there should be a heavy thumb on the scale in favor of strict liability. 
there's also though just a practical argument for strict liability, which is namely the difficulty of obtaining evidence. Uh, blasting operations, fireworks accidents, and other explosion related activities are some of the very few areas, at least in US domestic tort law, that are still regulated under strict liability regimes. And that's because it's really difficult for a plaintiff to prove that a defendant has acted unreasonably when all of the evidence has been destroyed in the explosion. Analogous arguments, I think, support employing strict liability in the armed conflict context, where it's also incredibly difficult for the victims to produce evidence of the attacking state's carelessness. Finally, and admittedly most ideally, I think a war torts regime needs to create an effective route to a remedy for innocent victims. This could take a bunch of you know, many different forms. It could take the form of an adversarial court-like system with cases before impartial tribunals who engage in fact-finding and attribution analyses and damage assessments. Or it could take maybe more of the form of a claims commission, and this is what I'm leaning towards right now, where states pay predetermined amounts, could be scaled in a bunch of different ways, and victims make claims that are later independently evaluated, kind of like a workers' compensation regime. Ultimately, though, it's difficult for me to reconcile the humanitarian aims of international humanitarian law with the current lack of a structure for creating accountability and providing compensation for innocent victims. Okay, in conclusion, as I've detailed today, New weapons technologies are highlighting the accountability gap that is at the heart of international humanitarian law, the lack of legal accountability for the harms to civilian caused by lawful acts in armed conflict. By throwing these issues into sharper relief, uh, new technologies highlight the need for mechanisms to hold states accountable for these undesired harms. And hopefully these new issues will be a spur to fix this very old problems. There will certainly be a host of implementation challenges to developing a war towards regime, but ultimately I think it is past time to ensure that international humanitarian law includes mechanisms to better serve its foundational aim of minimizing and alleviating civilian suffering in armed conflict. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and discuss this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, very, very clear and um, convincing lecture, in my opinion. I have to say that I cannot agree more on the need to look beyond individual responsibility, which is, in my view, also too much been dominating debates on uh, accountability with regards to AI and that, yeah, state responsibility, especially in the context of armed conflict, has an important role to play. Uh, we already have a, a bunch of questions coming in. Um, I invite all participants to uh, type in questions in the chat box, and so far all of them are very long, so I'm going to need a minute to go through them. Um, okay, right. I need a minute to catch my breath. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a, a question, which is also actually something that I was asking myself, so I'd like to ask it first, which is um, uh, basically to ask through which avenues should we pursue and develop the war thought regime that you advocate for? Uh, will it be within, would it be in your view within the framework of IHL or public international law more generally or rather at the level of domestic law? And additionally, uh, how to convince or force states to accept uh, a liability regime such as the one you advocate for? Will, will states be convinced? Okay, two different, very hard questions that were <laughs> short to ask, but I'll try not to take too, too long in, in trying to respond to them. Um, so first of all, how to do this? Should it be done through uh, domestic law? Um, should it be done through current international institutions? Should it be instituted by creating a new treaty regime with a new institution? all of these would be great, right? I think all of them are potential routes towards establishing war towards regimes. Um, and I don't think that they necessarily need to be mutually exclusive. Um, I think some will be practically 
easier to create than others. Um, and so it's easy for me from like an interest of seeing this happen in practice quickly. I would like to see it happen through domestic law. Like that could be a route towards create, you know, establishing the concept and having it become a more familiar idea. Uh, it could also happen through existing international institutions. Like obviously it's going to be very jurisdiction dependent. So you know, could have a case to, brought before the ICJ, much as we've seen cases for uh, transboundary harms in, in, in times of peace, there could be a, a mirror case for transboundary harms in times of war. Um, or specifically using the term war torts. I think as a scholar, I have <laughs> like the ability to say uh, the ideal thing I think would be a new clarified institution, right? Either uh, a new treaty regime or a new independent international organization uh, that really is, is more comprehensive in, in setting out the structure, the goals and, and how those are effectuated. Um, second question. Wait. Oh shoot! I think I've forgotten it. It was also uh, good. What was it? It is. But how? How would state actually accept such strategy? Ah, yes. Regime? State interest in this. So obviously, that's a huge stumbling block. Anytime you propose that some entity be more liable, um, they're not going to be very excited about that, especially when they are the entities making the law in the particular legal context, as states obviously are in international law. Um, I think there is a really there's interesting precedent that is developing around states use states voluntary payment of ex gratia payments uh, or condolence payments that we are already seeing in armed conflict. Uh, it, I think studying these, the incentive, like why states find it beneficial to make these payments um, and create these regimes. I think and this is work I, I still have to do, I want to do, but I think studying those incentives would really inform creating arguments for why states might also be incentivized to participate in a war towards regime. Uh, clearly, there is some interest that the state is, <laughs> there's some state interest in, in making these payments, but they've been heavily critiqued both be, uh, as, as uh, systems largely because they're highly discretionary. The payments that are made have been highly discretionary um, and highly variable and uh, very dramatically uh, from region to region, from conflict to conflict, and from individual to individual within a conflict. And, and so I think uh, those would be concerns that could also inform a war towards regime. The importance of standardization and fairness is going to be uh, a really important element for establishing the legitimacy of a war towards regime. I also think, um, this is one this this concern of state interest is one of the reasons I think a claims commission model, some sort of trust model is going to be more successful than an adversarial system or a new tribunal like a new, you know, I don't think I don't think what we need is a new international criminal court, a new international war torts court. I think um, a claims commission model would be more appealing to states in that they could pay in and you know reap the <laughs> the normative benefits of saying we are donating this much to victims of civilians uh, you know civilians who have been harmed in armed conflict generally right, and create a fund that then could be administered by an independent entity um, that would evaluate civilian claims so it wouldn't be civilians versus the state right or critiquing a particular state and and you know dragging that state's name through the mud regardless of how much it deserved to be uh but it would be civilians saying we've been harmed in war and the trust um being responsible for evaluating those claims and and making payments i think that would be a lot more appealing to states as a mechanism yeah, and the, the claim commission model is also what has been implemented in some uh, UN or NATO piece of operations where, well, there's also the liability gap due to organizations being immune from uh, trial in most courts and also the image importance for the UN to, to give an image of bringing the peace and not just uh, uh, accidents and, and damage. Um, 
but indeed then there's the issue of transparency uh, on which rules are compensations uh, made. Uh, then to follow up on that, say that uh, another avenue you mentioned is uh, the domestic law uh, avenue and you could have some states, I don't know, perhaps the Netherlands feels like it wants to take a lead adopting domestically uh, stricter liability regimes for uh, damage uh, it causes in war. But a question uh, from the audience which relates to that is the, the issue of implementation and enforcement from the point of view of the victims. Because we have those, you know, um, uh, Western or, or number of states conducting war in four countries far away, um, even even in, even in the current framework, when there's an international law violation that can be demonstrated, it's very difficult for the victims to reach the court. You know, so so how do we address that? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I don't want to sound like a broken record. I think this is another argument for a claims commission model no. uh, that would include as as part of its structure, right, uh, systems of making it easier for civilians to to file and bring claims, right? That's not going to be incentivized in an adversarial model, right? There's all re all sorts of reasons to throw up roadblocks in an adversarial model, uh, both for uh, yeah, oftentimes even just for political reasons of the state that the civilian, you know, is a national of might not want their civilians, their citizens bringing suit against allies, right, or prefer, you know, would be allies of the state. Um, but depoliticizing that with a claims commission, I think could all one would depoliticize it Two. Uh, part of the claims commission's mandate could be to help facilitate claims and and incentives could point towards doing you know could be oriented to to do so i also want to know in terms of how do we create such a regime and by the way i just love that we've skipped over that we need like any questions about needing this regime and jump just to implementation so clearly i've sold everybody that we <laughs> <laughs> just need the regime, um, but because all we're focusing on implement is implementation here. Um, it doesn't need to be done across the board all at once for all accidents. I think autonomous weapon systems, which are weapon systems that are capable of independently selecting and engaging targets, right, and uh, which are already in use uh, by 30, 30 states right, the militaries of 30 states, weapon systems with varying autonomous capabilities. I think they provide a, a particular, like <laughs> a crack in the wall <laughs> and a particularly good model or, or focus for creating war towards liabilities because the nature of autonomous weapon systems, these systems that have this X factor, this ability to make decisions, really makes that causal chain even more complicated, really makes it more difficult to say that the user acted with any kind of requisite mens rea. Um, and, and I think it makes, it makes the conflict <laughs> and the accountability gap clearer, and it makes the need for war towards clearer. So in terms of implementation, it could also be done with an, an ideal, you know, an initial focus on creating accountability for autonomous weapon systems and the accidents they cause. Yeah, I like this idea too. I think we should bring it further to some governments. But um, actually, so we do have questions that also challenge the fundamental premises okay. of your model. Oh, so crap. <laughs> let's go into there. Um, one of the participants um, is of the opinion that IHL was not designed to minimize civilian losses, that it is created to balance military necessity with humanity. And therefore, that's why collateral damage is not forbidden, only disproportionate collateral damages. Um, this person is of the view that IHL, as it is, is balanced, um, and that we should not only look at the damage done to civilians, uh, but not ignore, look also at the other pillar, which is namely fighting a war. So that's, of course, a core question in your argument. How do, how do you answer such questions? Oh, I, I don't disagree at all. When I say that one of the goals of IHL, international humanitarian law, is minimizing civilian suffering in war, I'm definitely not saying that's the only goal of IHL, right? Certain, and, and so this balance between military necessity and humanity, 
uh, which Mike Schmidt wrote about and wrote a great article about this. I, I think that's completely congregant with my argument for war torts. So all the time in domestic law, we have tort law, right? Which is law, <laughs> a lot of people call it the law of accidents um, to create accountability for activities that are useful, right? That are valuable, but that are also dangerous. And so in the talk, I gave the example of uh, demolishing a building, clearly a lawful activity, clearly also an inherently dangerous activity. And we want a legal regime that balances <laughs> and creates accountability and incentives to one, engage in that activity safely, and two, only engage in that activity when it's necessary. And what I see right now without having accountability for collateral damage, uh, for accidents and war, for other sources of undesired civilian harm, is I think that the IHL balance between military necessity on one hand and humanity on the other is out of balance, right? We've given, we've given almost no weight to the humanity part of the balance when we say that there's no liability for accidents and war. And so I'm, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> that states need to be able to fight wars, um, right? I, 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 I live in this world <laughs> and I see reasons why states engage in armed conflict. I think that balance needs to be more balanced than it is currently. Thanks. Um, another question uh, is that, um, so your, your system of, uh, your proposal for war towards fields in a contiguity gap, but and, and you insist that it's it's supposed to be complementary to criminal liability and, and such damages. But in the end, it's still, you know, it, it, you focus on um, yeah, on towards liability. So then there's still an accountability gap related to the criminal aspect and the individual criminal responsibility. And, and of course, with technologies, these gaps this gap is even widened. So do you also consider that efforts should be made also at the level of individual responsibility? So no, I, I so here, here's like just a fundamental disagreement I have with some people who are, who are advocating for expanding criminal liability to encompass accidents in armed conflict. And I'll, um, I might just use the case of autonomous weapon systems again, because I think this really highlights the issue. If an autonomous weapon system acts in an unexpected way that no one could have predicted, right? Like due to bugs, due to complex cascading errors, due to misreadings, you know, poor training data set, what some combination of things that makes it impossible for the user to have predicted that it was going to act in that way. I don't think there should be criminal liability for that. I think criminal law exists to punish and deter blameworthy actions. And I think using, some, using technology that acts in an unexpected way is not, an like in terms of either that individual user or their commander, is not an individually blameworthy action. And that's what, and that's where I think tort law sweeps in to address it, right? And that's where, but because there's a sense that there should be some form of accountability there. And that's what I think tort law encompasses. There have been uh, some arguments that we should maybe expand command responsibility, which is a doctrine of indirect criminal liability to create criminal responsibility, criminal liability for the accidents of autonomous weapon systems. But I think this misunderstand this this stretches the doctrine beyond all meaning. Command responsibility holds that a commander who knew or should have known that a soldier was about to commit a war crime or committed a war crime has the duty to either prevent that crime or punish it. Now, if you take command responsibility and apply it to autonomous weapon systems, the commander then you'd say has a duty to. Uh, that they know, knew or should have known that the autonomous weapon system was going to act unpredictably and thereby had a duty to prevent it or punish it. You can't punish autonomous weapon systems, right? They're not human beings. <laughs> and so that drops off entirely. And then all we're left with then is that the commander had a responsibility to prevent 
all accidents. And I think that is an impossible standard. And if we create criminal liability for people to prevent accidents, I think it's, it's like, on one hand, you know, the argument would be like, oh, then, then no one's going to engage in war. Well, but no, that's not what's going to happen, right? Um, it's going to be that the law is going to lose power because it's creating and it's going to create an untenable standard and it won't, there won't possibly be compliance with that standard. So I, I don't think we should try and inject this sort of reasonable care standards into criminal law. I think criminal law should punish blameworthy actions intentionally targeting civilians, right? In <laughs> intentionally harming people. And I think tort law, just as it happens in domestic law, should be used to address accidents. Okay, so I get your point, but uh, what I wonder is then how, you know, if, if, if more and more, if it, is it not also an incentive for states to more and more uh, uh, deploy autonomous weapon system that are, oops, unpredictable, so that so that no one can be responsible in case of harm. So, so there is that. And also quite a few uh, questions I think relate uh, to this is where, where do we place the cursor between something that is blameworthy or accidental when it comes to technologies with a certain degrees of autonomy, which varies, you know, you have the, the in the loop, on the loop, out of the loop and, and all, all in between and which turns in, uh, in turn to degrees of intent. Eh? Uh, so, where do we place the cursor to, to make sure that, that, uh, that deploying autonomous weapon system is not either uh, a shield to any type of criminal responsibility? Yeah, so, so that question assumes a lot, right? <laughs> so that question assumes that states will want to deploy systems that are going to act unpredictably. I don't think most states want to do that. Right. In addition, individual criminal liability is not the only constraint on state action. Right. There's also retaining control <laughs> as much of po as possible of what's going on in, in an armed conflict environment. There's also reporting. Right. There's also naming and shaming. So there are a host of reasons why a state is not going to want to be like is not going to want to deploy a bunch of completely unpredictable systems and then sit back and say, well, but you can't hold us criminally liable for that, right? There's a, whole, a bunch of other reasons of, of incentives not to just deploy unpredictable systems. Two, I think to the extent these systems are have some inherent element of unpredictability within them, that's, that's where war tort liability can create a cost for states of deploying these systems, right? In the in the hopefully extremely rare situations when these accidents manifest, when these errors result in harm, then then the state would be, and this is this is where the claims commission thing does get a little bit trickier, right? But um, then it's like, how would you hold the state proportionately responsible for those those types of accidents? Um, and so you, then you create some, dis some, maybe some disincentive there. It's gonna vary state to state. I think also a lot of work is gonna be done by the recklessness standard uh, and the individual criminal liability state, right? So individual criminal liability exists when an individual acts willfully, which is defined as act acting either intentionally, I, I intended to target those civilians or recklessly. I took action, not necessarily intending to cause the harm to civilians, but with knowledge of the high risk that that harm to civilians would result in without really caring. And I can see some room for expanding what constitutes reckless activity when using systems with known high error rates, right? I think then you could get to individual criminal liability quite, quite justifiably under a broad reading of recklessness. Yes, okay. Um, thank you so much. We have more questions, uh, but I'm afraid we've reached uh, our time oh. limit for today. <laughs> that just flew <laughs> it by. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is 6 p.m. here. It's uh, 12 noon for you. 
Uh, really, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the lecture as well as the discussion. Um, thanks you to everyone in the audience for your participation and for uh, engaging in, in those questions. It was uh, really interesting. We look forward to your upcoming publication that you've uh, hinted on on this topic. And um, yeah, I just want to um, give a note to the audience that the next uh, Dilemma Lecture will take place on 22 February next year with Professor William Busby. Uh, so please keep an eye on the Yasser Institute website for more information. And also, if you're interested in this issue, I invite you to check uh, the Winter Academy that we organize at the Yasser Institute on artificial intelligence and international law, where some of those issues will also be discussed. Um, Rebecca, thank you again. And um, uh, yeah, wishing uh, you a good day and wishing people in Europe a good evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care.